Welcome to another State of the Nation webinar. I'm Michael Sham, and today we are here with the Chief Economist from the Efficient Group, Mr. Davi Root, one of South Africa's top economists, certainly one of my favorites. It's been a while since I've worked with Davi, but boy, if there's anybody who can look through the clutter, it's Davi Root. Davi, welcome to the State of the Nation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're going to kick off with a story that I found absolutely <laughs> fascinating. And uh, I know that uh, some people may have heard, some people may not have heard. You happened to be in Russia when the invasion was taking place. Yeah. And then you got sort of stuck in Russia. Is that correct? Yeah, more or less. Um, I'm married for my sins. I'm married to a Russian girl. And there was a, a family wedding taking place uh, at the Black Sea. And we thought this is a good opportunity for the kids to see their babushka again. So we went to Russia and we, came, we went in with the South African passports. The kids now. My wife on her Russian passport and I'm the South African passport and the kids on South African passports because they've got dual citizenship. And we had a, f a, a lot of fun in Russia and I learned a lot about Russians and they, what they think about the, the war in Ukraine. And that I used this as an opportunity to find out what the impact of the sanctions were and still are on the Russian economy and you know generally what the Russians think about this and on our way out on the airport late at night wanting to go through customs for a final time to get on the plane my wife went through with the Russian passport but just before she went through uh, one of these officials asked her so the kids you see you Russians so the kids are they Russian citizens and she, she said yes and when we got to the front they asked where the Russian passports are for the kids and I uh, said, no, they, they don't have Russian passports. And they said, but it's illegal for Russians to tra travel on without Russian passports, Russian travel documents. And they refused to let the kids go. So they, they went in with South African passport, but they couldn't get out. Long story, big fight, wife in tears, kids semi-hysterical, late at night. They kicked us off the plane, took off the uh, luggage, sent us back, and they were, we were in, uh, in the middle of the night just after 12 o'clock with our luggage, uh, nowhere to go, no money because of sanctions, my credit cards do not work, and there we were. So fortunately, they still had our, our Russian uh, SIM cards, and we called some people, and they brought some rubles to us, and organized us to stay over in a boutique hotel, which is nothing <laughs> <laughs> of the sorts, but anyway, a boutique hotel, and then the next day we moved to, to, uh, to the friends of ours um, flat in Moscow, and we had to stay over for a couple of days to fix the passports for the kids and then we, we were allowed to let out. So now just to set the scene, this happened when this was in March? Yeah, we came back. No, no, we came back mm. now in, 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 in June. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was, so it was really recent. Yeah. And it's, it's obviously a hell of a story and it just gave you a bit more of, a, of an opportunity to have a look at the, call it the Russian situation or the Russian condition. Yeah, well, okay, my first, there are a couple of imp impressions, my couple of first impressions. Obviously, this is a country at war, um, and I was a bit worried to take the kids there and to take my wife be, uh, there, but I, of course, as we speak to Russians, and they, it was very clear it's safe to go there, and I won't take my kids into a war situation, so I made clear about that, I'm sure about that. So we got there, and uh, my first impression, first of all, the economy is cooking. It's just pumping. There's no, th they've got everything and lots of everything and a bigger variety of things on their on their shelves than what we have in South Africa. So that the first thing is there's no sign of any economic slowdown whatsoever. I spoke to the Russians, they do complain a little bit about inflation, but that's a worldwide thing at the moment. So they complain about inflation, especially the elderly that dependent on, on, a, on a fixed income. So they complain about inflation. But for the rest, they do, all everybody's telling me the economies are cooking. So that's the first thing is that the economy is doing very well. That was my first impression. No sign of sanctions whatsoever. The second thing is that I really picked up is that the Russians simply do not talk about the war. Um, I spoke to many Russians. Of course they talk about the war, and of course the news media report about the war. But we speak about the war more in South Africa than what the Russians uh, uh, discuss the war. And we were at a city called Sochi, which is also on the Black Sea, pretty close to the Ukraine. And I spoke to people with families in Ukraine and uh, heard a couple of very, very personal stories about that. But, they, by, but people simply do not talk about the war. It's not as if they are scared, uh, because I know people personally and after a couple of vodkas and so on, people get the tongues get a little bit loose and there's the relationship 
that the Russians have with vodka. It's true. All the <laughs> stories are true. <laughs> so, so I spoke about the Russians, but the w war is not a topic uh, that people really discuss there. Yeah. And uh, the, the, some of the, the obvious questions that uh, need that sort of go along is uh, or an observation, firstly, is that uh, too many of the people that will be watching this, you know, I cer certainly lived through South Africa in the isolation days, and we were also at war, uh, you know, technically yeah. up on the, the, the Namibian-Angolan border, yeah. and it was... You could go for days not understanding that parts of the country w was at war. Is it a similar situation? Well, obviously, the media is, uh, is uh, very strictly controlled by the authorities, the Russian authorities, but the Russians are aware of this. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to one of the best people to speak to are taxi drivers because yeah. they know stuff. Yeah. They drive people around and they know if there's been an explosion somewhere or a this or a that or whatever. So I've spoken to taxi drivers, not that easy because mm. I mean, uh, the they know the, the Russian, uh, the, the language issue and so on. But the Russians are very much aware that the news is <laughs> managed by, by the authorities. Pretty much the same what we had in, in South Africa. But I think they are, we are also, the news that we are fed is also s sort of filtered to yes. an extent. Yeah. And we have to be aware of that. And I'm not taking sides here on the Russian side or the Ukrainian side or whatever, and I've got my own view on these sort of things. But, but what we should all be aware of is that there are many moving parts mm. uh, that led up to this conflict and that is currently happening. Yeah. And there's a historic context that, that's important to understand. So it's not only a matter of Putin uh, getting up one morning with uh, the wrong foot out of bed and decided to invade the Ukraine. There's, there was a, there, there's, there's a context to the whole yeah. thing, and try to understand that. That's all I'm trying yeah. to say. So let's just break that down. Uh, you know, we don't just, just to set the scene. Obviously, the question that on most people's lips, because we, you know, if we could deal with the media, nothing proves that um, we are filtered one particular story just by the taking off of satellite television although it was a global decision, of Russia television. Yeah. So you can still get access to it, by the way. Yes. If you have the necessary links, you can still watch it. Yes. And you can, you can watch it through their, their website. And, yeah. and uh, I have done this, and it's almost watching the same story, but with 180-degree different coverage. Well, that is a lot of propaganda. Yes. RT is a lot of propaganda. But it's a good thing to watch yes. it. You get a, bit, a, a, slight of a, a yeah. slightly angle to things. But maybe I can just, you know, the question is, is that do the Russians support this yes. war? And that's the wrong question. You okay. have to understand, again, the context and everything. Uh, when we were there, uh, it was their national, their big national day, the 9th of May. It's a mm. major day for the Russians because that is the day that they, they celebrate their victory over Nazi Germany. It's a big thing. Yes. It's a really, you, I mean, you cannot over emphasize how important this specific day to the, yeah. to the Russians are. And people have to remember that Russia lost more people in the war than any other they, country. Than any other country. People, it, right? The country was destroyed after yeah. the war. And it's a big thing for the yeah. Russians. So remember that. And we were there. We were on a red plane on the day before. And they were, uh, one would have expected uh, military vehicles and um, you know, security people and all that. There was nothing of the sorts. Nothing mm. there. And not in the middle the center of Moscow, nothing of this. The next day, there were a lot of marches and soldiers and planes and Putin and all of that. Um, but, but that's important to understand that the Russians absolutely adore their, their military forces. The military forces can't do a thing wrong. So it doesn't matter where they are, the Russians will support their forces. They will support their boys or their girls in, in many instances. So uh, uh, if it's whether you agree with what they're doing or not, you support your forces mm. and that's it. You understand that. Uh, but there are many other things that I think are important. Questions like, for example, do they support the Russians taking over the eastern part of the Ukraine, known as the so-called Donbass area? Do the Russians support the, the, Russian, the Russians generally support the taking over of, of Krim, which is called Crimea in the west? Krim, that, that, that island part. And the answer to that is, I think the most Russians support Russia taking over the Donbass area because the majority of people there are, are Orthodox Russian uh, uh, religion, belong to the Orthodox Russian church. 
they ethnic Russians, they speak Russian mostly, and the Krim was part of Russia anyway, yeah. until I think Khrushchev, Khrushchev gave it to the Ukraine one day. Yeah. In, in fact, before the Russians, it belonged to the Tartars. Mm. So it never really was part, it was part of the, of the Ukraine only for a few, a few decades. Um, and so most Russians probably support the taking over of the Donbas area, and I can, this is one thing that I am very sure of. Mm. There's no way you're going to get the Russians out of Donbas or out of the Krim. From now on, it's part of Russia, and that's the reality that we have simply have to live with. Yes. And then uh, another question is, what about the Russians supporting Russia's invading the rest of the Ukraine? And I'm not so sure the majority of Russians necessarily will support that. I don't mm. think so. I think Putin made a huge tac a, a tactical mistake by, by, uh, by, in, by trying to take over Kiev. Mm. He thought that the, the Ukrainians going to start waiting for him with the little flags and so on. That didn't happen. What became very clear is that the Russian army is not as strong as everybody thought, including Putin himself. Mm. They're unprepared and all of that. So that was a huge mistake. Uh, also keep in mind, there's another sliver of land called Transnistria. Mm. Just south of the Ukraine, there's another country called Moldova. And between Moldova and uh, Ukraine, it's a similar sort of ethnic makeup than what we have currently in Donbass. Mm. So, and it's quite possible that Putin may decide to go and take that over as well. And if he does that, he's going to lock or cut the Ukraine off from the Black Sea completely. Yes. But to coming back, so the majority of Russians will probably say, listen, it's not a good idea for, for, uh, for Russia to take over the rest of the Ukraine. But Donbass area, this is a given. It's going to be part of Russia from now on. And that, of course, uh, c creates, uh, if you accept that, then you will have a bit of an idea on what the future is going to look like. And I've got a few ideas what the future is going to look like because as an economist I try to figure these sort of things out. So I know the Donbass is going to be part of Russia, which means that commodity prices will uh, uh, probably remain uh, elevated, maybe not at the levels where they are now, the oil price for example. We're talking about a, a war that's going to go on for many, many years, and this conflict will go on for long, and it will probably be a low-level civil war kind of situation. Yeah. Now, on that, uh, just, just a question on, on, on that particular thing, Donbass and the Krim, the Crimea. It seems like uh, once Putin invaded back in 2014, it didn't feel like the Ukrainians had much energy in, in, in fighting to get that back anyway. Or he did. Yes. All he did basically by taking over the, the, the Krim was to move the, 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 the border gate. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Because they were, everybody kind of accept, accepted this. That it, historically it was part of Russia in any way. Uh, and I think he thought the same is going to happen to the rest of the Ukraine, which yes. didn't happen. Yeah. So, so, but I think the most likely scenario is a low level sort of. But there are a couple of other possible scenarios. One is, is that if, they, if accidents happen during wars, what if, if somebody by accident, and Americans are sending missiles now to the, to the Ukraine and many of the other countries in the world, and what if some trigger-happy Ukrainian decides to shoot the missile to Moscow, yeah. for example? Or there's a possibility that, that, most, that, that some of these other Balkan countries could be invaded by, uh, like for example, uh, Litova, I think, yeah. just cut off the railroad or making it difficult for, for Russia to get to Kaliningrad, which is yes. a, a Russian enclave. So what if Russia say, listen, but you guys are preventing me from getting to my to the another piece of Russia. So what if there's some sort of uh, an accident that happens and that can lead to, to the rest of the world getting involved in this can actually lead to a third world war. It can lead to a, a nuclear war, actually. Yes. In fact, the Russians actually sort of hinted in that direction. Listen, don't mess with us. You're yeah. going to get into real trouble. So that's a second possible scenario. And a third possible scenario is that the Russians decide, listen, enough is enough, we're going to take Putin out. And I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. And I also don't think Putin is sick, by the way. Okay. So, so we are set for some serious stuff that's going to go on for a long time. And in the meantime, there's the, the, the Chinese angle as well. And what people don't know, or very few people, people actually realize, that there are some territorial disputes between Russia and China going back a long time as well. So I've got a suspicion the Chinese are sort of sitting back and wait for the Russians to, to fight with the Western world until everybody is tired and then maybe just one day the Chinese will say the time has come for us now to take back some of those territories that we always was part of China and maybe make use of the opportunity to also invade uh, uh, Taiwan as well. So that's the possible scenario, but I think we're probably going to wait some years before that's going to happen. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, there, there, there's a couple of observations. Obviously, uh, it looks like one of the solutions might be what happened with Finland and Russia. And this goes back to the Second World War times. Oh, the so-called Finlandization, what's the yeah. fancy word for it? Yeah. Uh, which means, basically, uh, that Finland, uh, Russia will not invade Finland uh, as long as they do, do not join NATO or do not join the West in yes. some sort of al alliance. Yes. But in the meantime, uh, Putin wanted to prevent NATO to move further <laughs> to the east, and he, he achieved exactly okay. the opposite, because NATO and Sweden are probably going to join NATO, or rather Sweden and Finland probably going to join NATO uh, soon as well. And some other countries, like including the Ukraine, will probably join the European Union as well. Yeah, and of course, uh, the other net sort of perhaps miscalculation on Putin's side is to make Europe a little bit more muscular than what it has been over the last generation. Yeah, I must tell you, a, a couple of things are happening here. Remember the, the Germans, as an example, they, and since the Second World War, they've got this, this guilt complex. And suddenly, they're waking up. They're mm. waking up, and suddenly they started spending more on, 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 on defense, and they're contributing their part uh, to Western defense, if you like, or NATO defense and all that. So the, the Russia actually awakened a giant, and this giant is called Germany. Mm. It's the biggest economy in Europe by far. Mm. And not only that, depending what happens in China, the Chinese may actually uh, wake up the other giant, and that is Japan, which has been also, yeah. uh, since the Second World War, been very, very quiet as far as military activities are concerned. So if we now move to, to some of the other effects uh, that this could have, in the last generation, we've really cashed in a massive peace dividend globally. Mm -hmm. right, and for many people that aren't aware of the peace dividend, uh, that is when you stop spending ridiculous sums of money on military spending, right? Because I know my neighbor's not going to invade me. Mm -hmm. uh, the, my foe at the end of the Cold War, when everybody said, okay, fine, and military's shrunk, spending shrunk trade uh, really got going international trade and it's because that's the reason why we've got all these wonderful consumer goods today mm. it's the peace dividend more than anything yeah do you think that peace dividend is uh, is on its way out i think there are many other variables that that you have to be aware of as well and a very important thing is that the nature of economic growth and the nature of economic economic development is changing in a certain direction and it's picking up speed and uh, to make a long story short, basically economies evolve from your primary industries and from there into your secondary industries and then your tertiary industries. Now that, is ex that has accelerated in the last couple of decades and it's still accelerating and economic growth is happening in the modern part, the tertiary part. And that consists of things like what you're doing now, services, but other things also, things that can be digitized, this digitizable stuff. And that's in a way also fits in with work from home yes. kind of stuff. So that is something that you have to keep in mind that the nature of economic activities are changing. But you're absolutely correct. What we've seen the last couple of decades is the global village, global economic integration, uh, a value change developing all over the globe and, and world economies getting more and more integrated and so on. Now with this, with the COVID, and not only with COVID and the lockdowns, but this, this conflict that we're currently experiencing in Central Europe, much of that has been disrupted to a huge extent. Um, and you're right, the, 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 the part of the peace dividend, we've squandered past of the part of this peace dividend. Additionally, many countries now are moving where they used to move the production to the east, to China, for example, many American countries uh, or companies, they're moving, they moving those, taking those factories back, bringing them back to the United States because of their own technologi uh, technological advances, so they can make stuff easier and cheaper at home now. Uh, and China is actually exporting a lot of factories as well to cheaper mm. uh, labor destinations like, for example, uh, that, um, Vietnam is yeah, a very good example, Thailand. or Cambodia and places like that. So uh, the change is happening. How the whole thing is going to play out, I'm not so sure, but I think the big countries like the Chinese and Americans and Europeans and even Africa, we realize that it is important to maintain those sort of yeah. uh, that, that relationships and to keep part of the peace dividend at least alive and keep trade alive. Because yeah. that's a very important reason why the world achieved so much the last couple of decades. And maybe a very important point, the, the country that benefited most 
from globalization was actually China. Yeah, of course. And more than 300 million people was uplifted out of abject poverty uh, in a matter of something like 20 or 30 years or so. We do not have abject poverty in China anymore. So now, Davi, you know, I want to tell you a story that you may not know. And I know you know a lot of stories. Do you recall at the start of the COVID problem, the COVID uh, pandemic, there was the toilet paper issue with people yeah. stockpiling toilet paper. Yeah, Do you I know what that. the roots are of that situation? It's a fa fascinating economic story. I would like to know that because I couldn't figure that out. <laughs> okay, so the story goes back to Australia. And the situation when the pandemic started was that uh, everybody was fearing this lockdown which would stop everything. And it turns out that, uh, that Australia no longer produces toilet paper. It gets all of its toilet paper from China or overseas different providers it's an island nation and there was a very real possibility that you couldn't move any stuff in and out of australia which would mean that you could have a situation for as long as the the, the lockdown lasted that uh, toilet paper toilet paper is <laughs> going to run out and believe me uh, you know i think more than food and water if you have to tell middle class country that you're going to run out of toilet paper everyone's going to go and stock up which they did <laughs> But, of course, in the new age, the story gets around to every country. So it started a global run on toilet paper. But the point of the story, if you ask me, is the fact that Australia realized that they are very vulnerable in the industry of toilet paper, <laughs> right? And, uh, and surely the next result must be, I'd imagine, I haven't followed up, but I presume some entrepreneur has started a factory to do you know, to produce toilet paper in Australia because you don't want to be vulnerable again, right? And Russia's actions together with the COVID thinking, it, you do start looking around. And I tell you a toilet paper story as well. And it's the first time I went to Russia. The toilet paper is a very rough toilet paper without these little, this little ring inside that we yes. have in South Africa. It's, ah, just, okay. it's a, a roll of paper, but it's quite rough. Okay. It's, it's quite rough. And every time I go to Russia, every time I go there, I see that they've got slightly better quality toilet paper. You still get the rough stuff, but you get a single ply and a double ply and a three <laughs> ply. And today you get a huge variety of toilet papers in Russia. Right. <laughs> That's why they drink so much vodka. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but if we, if we can, uh, um, you mentioned China earlier. Now, at the moment, China is benefiting to the degree that they are getting... Uh, uh, the, the, the recent sort of reports say that they're getting crude oil from Russia at 30% discount. But obviously, uh, this is good for Russia in the short term. They, they, well, they found another market for their crude. But not only are they selling it at a discount, but they also got a huge shipping uh, situation, which they didn't have when they were supplying that to Europe. So for the, in the short term, this is good for, for China, but in the long term, it's going to be problematic for a few of the players. Can I, can I just make a few comments on, about sanctions? That's yeah, what you, sure. uh, because there are a couple of other things. I've made a rough calculation. I think obviously the Russian economy will be affected. I think less than 10% contraction in economic growth in Russia this year, which is not a train smash. Yeah. Next year, probably another minus 2% or whatever. So that's more or less... The, but I think uh, yeah, that's impact, one Jacob Zuma. That is that is pretty much yeah. indeed. So, but specifically, one or two things that the West implemented that I think is uh, important, and, and I felt it myself personally because I was on the airport in uh, in Moscow and I couldn't use my credit cards because Russia had been cut off from the Swift, Swift. system. Uh, but that's a bullet you can use only once. Yes. Remember, the Russians have something like 400 billion uh, reserves in the SWIFT system and some dollar, uh, some, uh, some remimbi and some gold as well, but about $400 billion that they cannot get access to now. The Chinese have an excess of $3 trillion, which is locked up, so to speak, or used or within a SWIFT system. Uh, and you can use this bullet once, and the West decided to use this bullet and to, to cut Russia off from the SWIFT system, and that's part of the reason why I think the Chinese will wait a little bit before they and do anything because they realize also that they can be cut off from the SWIFT system and what they're doing at the moment they've already started doing this to establish a new payment system between the Chinese 
and the Russians and a couple of other countries as well. So there are two problems when you talk about imports and exports. The one is the logistical problem, how do you get stuff in and out? And the second one, how do you get money in and out? Those are two important questions. So the money part they're trying to fix, and the money part is relatively easy to fix because many countries are still doing business with the, with the Russians, the Indians as well. Mm -hmm. So you can, it's a relative, well not easy, but it, it can be done to send money to Russia. Um, the logistic part is a little bit difficult because of, of Turkey making, can potentially blockade the Black Sea, for instance. But there are many countries around the Black Sea that are still friendly to Russia because you don't have much of a choice. Mm. Uh, Georgia is a very good example to that. And not only there, there's a long border uh, between Russia and China, of course. There are many places where you can import and export stuff from. So at the moment, the oil price is very high. Energy prices are very high. The Russians are coining it at the moment. The ruble is actually better and stronger today than what it, what it was before the invasion. Initially, they jacked up interest rates very, very high. I must tell you that central bank, a uh, very difficult name to pronounce, but she's doing a brilliant job from the Russian point of view. So she jacked up interest rates very high, supported the, the, the ruble, introduced a lot of foreign exchange regulations, and in the process, actually, and the dollar started appreciating, or rather, the ruble started appreciating again. Inflation went up. It's stabilizing. It seems it's probably going to be a bit of a problem for some time. Interest rates are lower now, and the ruble is much stronger than where it was. And they're coining it as far as uh, oil, oil exports and energy exports generally are concerned. But 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 over time, obviously, the West will find alternatives, and I think it will take about a year or eighteen months or so, and then the oil price is likely to dip below hundred dollars to ninety dollars or so. And I think, and I know, that the the West, some uh, na nations in the West are talking to countries like Venezuela, for instance, even to Iran, to fill that gap, uh, that eight billion. Uh, 8 million uh, barrels of oil that Russia used to provide to, the, to pr produce every, every day, that, that, that they're trying to find alternative sources. So I would say in the best kind, kind, uh, kind of scenario that the oil price is probably going to dip below $100 within a year or so. Yeah. And of course, there's the, the, the added problem of sometimes these kind of disruptions can really accelerate the technological uh, growth. Yeah, but you know, as far as energy is concerned, there's, there's another issue that, uh, remember energy prices were going up mm. before the invasion anyway. Commodity prices generally were going up because economies were, were opening up after the COVID lockdowns and all of that. But when it comes to energy, uh, the, the, the dirty energies like coal and gas and, and oil and that sort of stuff, we did not invest in those kind of things. We did not maintain those kind of uh, facilities or those mm. uh, be, uh, because for environmental reasons and green reasons and South Africa is a good example with our oil refineries as an example. But at the same time, the, the world did not yet invest enough in new hmm. renewable energies. And between these two, uh, the one not ready yet and the other one sort of neglected to an extent, the oil price and energy prices were going up in any event and then the war happened in the Ukraine and that the result of that was that energy prices went through the roof where hmm. it, it still is to a large extent. But this may hasten the, the development yeah, of it's probably gonna technologies. Yeah, but, but I also think, what I also think is we're going to go back to the old energies. The, 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 um, the, the Germans just started up their coal-fired oh. stations again. Any, uh, I, th I think this, this move to, the, to this huge push to the renewables will, will continue, but we're going to re we are certainly realizing that you have to look after the normal energy yeah. sources as well. Yeah, which then, of course, you, you can't mention energy and global disruption, and that brings us right back to South Africa. Can I make a prediction? Yes, please. And that is about energy prices going through the roof. But when you talk about oil, you talk about fertilizer as well, because the, 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 those, all those chemicals are pretty much interlinked. And we've seen fertilizer prices going up very, very sharply. Remember also that the Ukraine and Russia and many other countries like India, for example, and also China are major grain producers in the world. The Indians just stopped the export of grain. Ukraine is a major uh, uh, wheat producer and also sunflower producer and the same with the Russians. So all of the, the production, uh, uh, insect costs of agricultural insect costs has gone through the roof. Uh, diesel price is nearly 60% up in a year's time in South Africa. Uh, and at the same time, there's this disruption on uh, in, in, in agriculture and planting of wheat and that in Ukraine and also in Russia and all that. So there's going to be the ease. Uh, food prices has gone up a lot already 
And we are going to see famine in this world in the next couple of months. We are already seeing that. Places like Chad, for example, just announced uh, uh, some emergency situation because they have a shortage of food. The United Nations is already supporting countries like, for example, Chad. That's in Central Africa. Uh, other countries like um, uh, Sri Lanka. We know about Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Syria is a very good example. Uh, places like, even places like, uh, for example, well, Somalia, we know about that. Ethiopia, we know about it. Even places like, for example, Egypt. Those are countries, and Morocco is another one that's very much dependent on imports from places like, for example, the Ukraine. So I'm concerned about real hunger issues in the world, especially in the poorer countries of the world. Soon. Yeah. And with the first world at that point notably poorer than what they have been, yeah. it's not going to be popular with voters to go and uh, take food away. Now look at South Africa. We have massive levels of unemployment. We have rising levels of poverty. We have in South Africa kids dying from malnutrition. Kids dying from hunger. That's what we have in South Africa. More than 2,000 kids the past two years died from hunger. More than 2,000 kids. Um, and we have political leadership in South Africa, which is, <laughs> well, it's not there, basically, mm -hmm. because they, there's so much infighting. We do not have a government. They're just, they just fighting each other all the time. And now, in this situation, you find food prices going up and fuel prices going up a lot. Energy prices going up. This is a tinderbox. We, I'm very, very concerned about, uh, you know, what we saw, for example, last year in KZN. Mm. I'm, I'm worried about the spark that can get this whole thing going up in flames as well. I'm very, very concerned about South Africa. So, we've got a, we've got a ruling party, but not a government. Now, we have, we have a criminal organization uh, that's a highly incompetent, and uh, corrupt and uh, that's masquerading as a government that's what we have yeah and you and just have a look at the zonda commission report for instance i mean the, what the damage that was done to the south african economy by the anc government cannot be calculated yeah it is it's horrible just see what's happening at the local authorities the auditor general report just came out on the local authorities it is a disaster it is and the local authorities are crucially important because if you're a business person, that is your first contact. That's where you, where you start your business. You get electricity, you get a road, you get water, you get the, the refuse removal but from your municipality. You, that is the first contact for a business person. And the municipalities are falling apart, the local authorities. It's a mess. It's a disaster. They're dysfunctional. Two-thirds of them are dysfunctional. Uh, they fini financially, many of them simply will not be able to, uh, to continue. And it's not only them. The state-owned enterprises, yes. the state department, the fiscal accounts of the national departments are a mess, all of that. And it's all because of the ANC government. So how does this play out then, Dar Darby? What does it look like? What is it, you know, in that worst case scenario, what does South Africa look like one year from now? All right, the, the good and the bad part, but we have to get a, a good part as well. And I think yes. in, in a weird kind of way, in a perverse kind of way, there's a silver lining. But just look at the, what likely the outcome of all of this is going to be. We're going to see an increase. For the, the, the economy is not going to grow. The economy cannot grow because we don't have enough electricity. Mm. It's simple as that. So we talk about the best case scenario, 1% economic growth over time, sort of. With a population growth of 1.5%, it's very easy to see that things are not going to get better. So I think what we're heading for is uh, the sea of poverty in South Africa, more of the same with these islands of, of prosperity, kind of. That is what I, what I think, what it's going to look like, more or less. Until we change around, until we change around in terms of policies and we get a good, clean government and effective and so on, and that's not going to happen for at least the next two years anyway, yeah. because yeah. then it's the next elections. But the silver lining here, and that's the, actually the interesting side is, that we've got a government that's collapsing all over the place. And by the way, sometimes it's a good thing mm -hmm. to have an incompetent government because they can also not implement a bad idea. Yes. And that's the NHI. It's not yes. going to be implemented no. because, I mean, they can't run a bath of water. Okay? Yeah. So, so, so they, that's not going to happen. But in the meantime, we've privatized everything. Think about this. Mm -hmm. We've privatized the airways in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So we didn't privatize South African 
Airways, for example, but I mean, they're not even flying anymore. Yeah. What about the post office? Yeah. The post office, by the way, announced they're not going to deliver letters to the Ukraine and Russia anymore. I mean, they can't even deliver a letter yeah. to, to Centurion. Yeah. So, but we've privatized postal, postal yes. services in South Africa, and yes. the private sector is taking over that. Well, even the police has been privatized. Yeah. And, of course, uh, recently we saw the most crazy bit of privatization ever, and that was when uh, the president said that he was going to have relief funds to go to people that were affected by the floods in KZN, but he wasn't even going to let the government do it. Yeah. <laughs> so then, yeah, yeah. Doesn't the, even trust him. Doesn't even trust gonna... his own people yeah. to do it. Yeah. So he doesn't trust himself to do it. So, so, so yeah, that's we, where the opportunities are. Yes. So there are, there's so many risks in South Africa. And if you want to be a little bit technical, look at, for example, our returns on our capital market. Yeah. Mm. The capital market returns, the yields in the capital market is 10, 11 percent or so. I'm talking about government bonds here. Mm. So which is very, very high. And there are two reasons why it's very high. The one is because there are potential good returns if you can spot them in a country like this. And the mm. other reason why they are high is because of the high risks yes. involved here. So if you're a clever entrepreneur, in whatever industry you are, spot your risks, manage your risks. That's yes. very, very important. And the rest will come and you will make a lot of money. So there are many opportunities and I can see it every day. People finding opportunities in a country like this. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, it could have been yeah, so look, much easier. I'm, I'm positive on, on one other score and that is that uh, South Africa has economically performed best when we haven't had, let's call it government Efficient, efficient's not really a word I want to use with government. But if we go back to that period of uh, where the country was in tremendous flux in the late 80s, sort of 89 through to 93, when, you know, the old hadn't died yet and the new was, wasn't yet born, yeah, as they say. Yeah, yeah. And the country was not being run as, uh, as sort of proactively as normal. And that was when the economy flourished. Yeah, many parts of the economy right. started. But yeah, remember that was also a time when they started getting uh, sort of getting rid of sanctions and the world sort of could see where South Africa was going to. And that was in the beginning of the honeymoon time. It was in the beginning of the honeymoon yeah. time. But, but I'm saying there was, as a it business was. person, you kind of felt the fact that the government was distracted. You could feel the you energy. Could, you could in, feel that there was something yeah. was about to change. And, and you know, I think f if we're looking for a, for a reason to be positive, it might be that the government is distracted. Yeah, and but, so the question, so how long still? Yes. Because, I mean, this INC government is like, you know, yeah. so, so I think I think they're going to get less than 50% in the next election. Well, let's just get to the shorter term. Uh, Ramaphosa, despite having uh, apparently, allegedly, $4 million in a, somewhere hidden in his, <laughs> which he's not allowed to have, yeah. if that is the case, and there are questions about taxes and all that sort of stuff. Despite that, I still think he will be re-elected because there's nobody else. Yeah. There are one or two guys, Lamola, I like Lamola a lot. I hope he's going to become the next uh, deputy in South Africa. So that's, that's, but apart from perhaps him and one or two of the other guys, there really isn't anybody else but Ramaphosa there. Yeah. He's the only guy. Yeah. Of all, uh, but, and he's not good. He's not a no. good, he's not. So he's going to be, the, he'll be re-elected, I guess, and then it's the uh, elections again, and I think the ANC is going to get less than 50%. And that is a bit of a dilemma. Because mm. if you want to sit, put together a coalition, you, you must include either the INC or the EFF. Or the ANC and the EFF will be in a coalition in the next government. Mm. So if we, want to get, if we as South Africans want to get rid of the ANC in a coalition government, then you must get in bed with the EFF. So mm. that's the dilemma. Yeah. So if you look, because the ANC is still going to get more than 40%. Yes. I'm, I'm actually, uh, and I've done a, we've, we've done a lot of interviews around this particular question, I'm actually quite fond of coalitions. Yes, yeah, me too. Because they all, you know, despite the fact that we had, you know, we, we, everybody was quite scarred by the, the, the aftermath of 2016 where the coalition seemed to have, have problems. But I think it, in a way that proves to me just where the ANC is now. If we go back to those uh, local government elections we had in, in, in 2016, which, or 2017, with, uh, 2016, uh, and, and there were a few coalitions cobbled uh, together, DA ran uh, mm. Joburg and Chwani and Nelson Mandela Bay, and then those coalitions gradually fell apart. And the biggest reason they fell apart was that there was a highly energetic ANC undermining them at every, mm -hmm. at every uh, turn. 
And now we've seen the weirdest thing. I was writing about this the other day, and that is that uh, the ANC seems to not even have any energy to fight back against these coalitions. Yeah, yeah. And it just goes to prove that, that they're a party that is not in decline. It's a party that has declined. Yeah, they finished. They, we're just waiting for there. the end now. We're just waiting now. Um, so, uh, as they used to say, that, that uh, wonderful saying in the army, I don't net omfall and stink, <laughs> right? Uh, because they are dead already. But, but, but then something else I've picked up, and maybe you, I'm sure you've picked it up as well, is that if, if the coalitions with opposing, uh, uh, totally opposing uh, political parties seem to be more stable than coalitions with parties that are fairly close, close yes. ideologically. Yes, because you, you, you then, uh, when they're so close, there's, a, there's that sort of contestation down to the last uh, yeah. uh, uh, full stop. Yeah, you know, and, and mm. obviously what we're starting to, we're starting to see a few things uh, that, are, that are interesting to me because we're starting to see at local level where some of these other parties have taken over. Yeah. Uh, a big broadcast of the achievements, which is something that we, we, we're unaccustomed to. You know, we're seeing some good work from, from even Gayton McKenzie, for heaven's sake. Right? You would have bet against him being a, a, a good uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, pol uh, politician or certainly leader, but we're starting to see that. So, yeah, I wonder if South Africa, and the, the one thing that coalitions will do is that you'll have traitors from within. So if money does get misappropriated, your coalition partners are going to speak up much quicker. I have one big concern, one big concern. Before we get rid of the ANC, will the ANC allow us to get rid of the ANC? I think that they do not have the energy to fight back. This goes back to uh, what I'm seeing now in, uh, around the country. When they lose power now, it seems to be quite final. You know, obviously, the most radical example of that is the Western Cape, yeah. where you know, it's hard to believe that just sort of 12, 13 years ago they were in power. Now, this last government election, they, they polled 20% of the vote. You know, once, they, once they lost that control, once they lost the, the, the keys to the, the, the PIN code, to the, <laughs> the ATM card, you know, their support just absolutely yeah. disappeared. And, and actually, I think I know why, you know, the, 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 it, it ties in with who else other than you mentioned Lamola, who else could, could be there. I think that um, <coughs> the problem with, with many liberation movements is that the people that end up liberating at the time become such iconic figures that they sort of hold power and it's very hard for them to develop other powers. They're not functionaries, they're leaders. These are guys that you're building statues of and naming airports after. Yeah. Uh, they're not politicians. Politicians have successes. Yeah. They're yeah. not. They're liberation heroes. And they can't speak ill of each other. They can't split on each other. They can't do anything. So, you know, th they're unfit for purpose. And when they go, they go. You've seen from India to Zambia to everywhere. all kinds of everywhere. And I think that South Africa is just going to follow the trend. So to me, that, that's the one thing that, that does give me some hope you yeah, know, for the future. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's see. Interesting place, South Africa. Two years to go and we'll find out yeah, how the thing's uh, going to pan out. You know, if we can, if we can just sort of uh, wrap up. You've had uh, <coughs> some experience now of uh, being in a country, you know, that like Russia, and you're back in South Africa? I'm glad to be back. Well, that was the question, you know. Where, we, you know, if you look at their problems versus our problems, you know, our problems uh, seem bad to us. Um, where yeah, well, if you talk to individuals, the guy on the street and so on, they've got a good life there, the Russians, and they're getting better, um, and comparing over time. Obviously, there are ups and downs now, but the Russians are getting more affluent and if you look at their supermarkets they've got a far bigger variety of cheeses and cold meats and whatever uh, and vodkas yes. <laughs> <laughs> in, in their supermarkets and not what we have in South Africa they're not as they're not so paranoid when it comes to personal security like what we are in South Africa South yes. Africa is a dangerous place yeah. and that is something that is something that is very very bad in South Africa and it is the, this is the it's a dangerous place. It's not a good place to be. You always have to spend. You have to spend a lot of energy yes. in protecting yourself and, and making sure that you are safe. But apart from that, you know, South Africa is an amazing place. There are really the opportunities in South Africa. We have um, <laughs> the, the, the most amazing steaks. I mean, yes. Russians do not understand meat. Nothing. <laughs> They're good with with pork and with um, cold meats. 
but they don't understand the real meat. They do not know what the real choppy is or the yeah. real steak is. They don't understand. And of course, they don't drink brandy and coke. Although, although, <laughs> <laughs> although I did pick up a few Russians that have started uh, putting some, some coke with their brandy, and I would like to take the credit for that. Okay, well, well done <laughs> to that, uh, Davi. Just, that's just what a country obsessed with vodka needs is to discover brand new <laughs> coke. Now, you know, the average life expectancy of Russians can go down even more. But Darby, I want to thank you so much for coming in today. It's been a wonderful chat. We're going to get you in again. Um, to everybody that's joined us today, I hope you've, uh, you've enjoyed yourselves. And uh, we'll see you again. Thank you so much for joining us today.